Dr. Matthew Stevens of our nation, Russia Assembly. Hallelujah. I, uh, I sang a song, I'm not a singer, but on watch night that I've been carrying all around, uh, and it's going to be a part of my anthem for 2016, because uh, it's something that I'm just so grateful for. How many of you know this is a year of gratitude? I'm just so excited on, yes. about all the things that the Lord has done and yes, been ready to do. And the Lord told me he hadn't even played his best hand yet. How many of you excited about that? Song so says, From the rock, come on, son. Sing up the song. Come on. Oh, to the going down. Come on, let's sing that. Oh, the same. He is worthy. Y'all know that, don't you? Jesus is worthy. He's worthy. Come on, sing it with me. Be to be praised. Y'all know that? Put your hands up. Praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Come on, let's go. Praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Y'all know that? This is Jesus. Hey. Blessed Savior. Come on, I want to hear you. He's worthy to be praised. Next verse says, God is Come on, he's a strong, y'all know that, y'all too y'all, deliver, come on, in him, for I touch, oh, praise him, praise him, y'all know that, praise him, praise him, his name is
precisely. Encourage our hearts about all you're about to do in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to first nation, tell them neighbor. Neighbor. Great men and women. Great men and women. Are only born for the time. That they are needed the most. And the only reason you're still here is because God is not finished. If this were everything life had to offer, then you'd have a reason to quit. But because he's not finished, come on, pretend like you got some power. Tell him, but because he's not finished, you've got to press a little harder and see what tomorrow holds. Take your men and give God some ugly juice with the praise Come on, okay, what's wrong? Praise him because he's not finished. Praise him because he's still working. Run away to God. Hallelujah. Come on, praise him. You feel better. It's glad in here. Come on, praise him. Yeah. Hallelujah. God is so good. Have a seat. Have a seat. We're going to get into the word of the Lord tonight. I got quite a bit of scriptures um, to give you, but I'm so excited to be here. I'm so honored to be here. Um, God is good and he's been faithful to us and um, he's been good. How many of you are excited to be in 2016? Uh, you need to be reminded that you don't deserve oxygen, air, or opportunity. We, we have a strong entitlement in the black church. How many of you know God don't owe you nothing? How many of you thankful for the blood? How many of you thankful for mercy? freedom, forgiveness. It's an awesome time to be alive. And God is doing so much and I'm excited to be here. Pastor Jason at Ebony Long, I, I was telling my Periscope family the other day, and Pastor Jason is probably one of the coldest preachers in the nation. Uh, she don't know that we're excited and serious about what God is doing with him and with them. Yes. Do me a favor, let's honor them one more time today. Come on, let's honor them one more time. say uh, you would have to be plum fool crazy to call yourself to pastor people. Yes. It is something yes. uh, oh that I tell think you need mental help with Come on, tell the to truth. assert yourself in a career like this one. My uh, God. Because the level of responsibility yes, God. of having to report to God not just for your soul yeah. uh, but for the souls of people who are all undecided about who they want, what they want, what they're going to do. Uh, it makes it very difficult. So I really grieve for preachers who uh, brutalize this function and see it as the apex of their career. And because pastoring is now an arrival point, confirmation that you've gotten uh, good at preaching enough to want to do it. It literally is a destiny call. Uh, and it's hard. You know, you've got to be sane enough to stable the insane. And uh, we thank God for the passes who are stabilized. Amen. Come on, my Hallelujah. It's an awesome, awesome thing. Amen. And an hour for people have been married two years and getting divorced. Five wow. years is an accomplishment. Come on now, yes. Come on, church. You're going to say something now. Amen. So we're excited for five years. I have a word from the Lord. I'm going to preach through this. Uh, and we'll do some prophesying tonight and uh, see what the Lord says. So uh, do yourself a favor and give me all your amens during the preaching so you can afford offense when I prophesy. Amen. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Hallelujah. How I many you know God is not loyal to your secrets? Come on. Loyal to God. Go to 1 Samuel 17. And uh, we're going to preach tonight. I'm going to give you several uh, segments of this. This is a five-fold conference. And I need to set this up for what we're going to accomplish this weekend. And um, I want to do this with a familiar story that I think is going to be relevant and relative to your understanding of where we are in this moment. When you're at 1 Samuel 17, say, I'm there. I'm there. If you're not there, say, please wait. Please wait. I'm going to wait for the remnant. Come on. Glory to God. The folks that said, I'm there, tell the please wait is to hurry up. <laughs> hurry up. There you go. Come on. Hallelujah. <laughs> 1 Samuel 17, verse 1 through 10, and then I'll give you another segment as I walk through what this means to you. But 1 Samuel 17 reads this in the, in the New International Version. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soka in Judah. And they pitched camp at Ephes Damon between Soka and Ezekiah. And Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped 
in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. How many of you know that there is a such thing called battle lines? Mm -hmm. If you are in a dead church, you don't know anything about this. But scripturally, there are moments in history where battle lines are drawn and where God and his adversary come to points of conflict. Say amen. Amen. Points of war. And contemporarily speaking, it shows up in legislation. It shows up in scandal. It shows up in falsehood. But there are periods and moments where battle lines come among us. Verse 3 says, the Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. Verse 4, a champion named Goliath, y'all know him? Oh, come on. Who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. That translates into nine feet six inches. So this guy, I know historically, if you uh, pay more attention to Disney or coloring books than you do the scriptures, they paint him like he was 20 to 30 feet tall. And the nine foot is still, even when you're from the hood, nine feet is still significant to try to fight. But uh, he was actually nine feet, six inches tall. And the Bible refers to him, the accurate word is champion, which means he was somebody who was skilled in the science of defeat what it took to defeat an opponent. When you have become a champion, it means that you have taken on uh, the, the, the commitment to defeating things that either uh, are insignificant, are frail, are beneath you in authority. So this was a champion. And not only was he a champion, he was a champion who had set himself against God's people. That's important that you realize. Uh, his name was, he was from Gath, and he came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span, and he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and bronze javelin was slung on his back. Look at me. So to paint the picture of what this looks like, this man is nine foot six tall. He's really buff, but he has protective gear and armor to make sure that if anybody wisened up to utilize or deploy some level of, of, of uh, machinery or weaponry against him, that if his height were not enough, they would still be not effective at reaching him because he had armor, things that protected his vulnerability. So let's, anybody, are y'all fighters? Are y'all gonna, uh, are we too? Are you gonna, anybody was a fighter in here? Now I know you're lying. I can point at several of you married no, couples no, right lying. now and tell you that y'all beat each other. I ask you, if anybody in here liars? Oh. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Lord have mercy. Fighters. Okay, so one of the I love boxing, wrestling, and my wife and I are movie heads. She likes romance. I think that's disgusting. I prefer watching something where somebody's going to get the brains beat out. Somebody's got to die. Sometimes it's crisis. You know, something just to satisfy the warlord in me, right? And uh, one of the ways that armor works is that it gives a greater battle advantage. So think about this in, in, in regards to darkness. If, if Israel, the people of God, has an opponent, he is taller, he is stronger, but this opponent is also protected or concealed by something so as to prevent the likelihood of anybody defeating him. Contemporarily speaking, that means that if we face or if the church is up against uh, a power, a prince, something that has decided to take it out, there are certain things that protect our ability to get to him. It may be your raggedy politicians. It could be your doctrines of devils from the pulpits of America. But certain things that conceal and prevent our ability to get the real thing. Does this make sense to you? So he had armor there. I want you to go to verse 8 to see what this Goliath did. It says, Goliath stood and shouted. Say shout it. Shout. Say loud. Say shout it. Shout. I want you to shout, shout it. Shout. Now, I know we are in the African American inter inner city church tradition. And what the word shouting means to us means a lot different than what it meant in the Bible. To us, it means you leave your body screaming hysterically, you have fits, and you punch people, and you violently brutalize the folk on the road. But here, contextually, shouting means to exert at his extreme volume something you have to say. It said he shouted to the ranks of Israel, pay attention church, why do you come out and line up for battle? In other words, do you even think that coming to me in some form of conflict or in some form of, 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 of combat 
is worth your job. Are you bringing a fight to me? Are you uh, uh, along my same rank or along my same line that we should even be equal opponents? So look at this. Probably because they were all built as mere men and this guy is a tall guy. He did not even see Israel as an adequate opponent. He's basically saying this is unfair. I'm too big. You'll never win against me. Why are you coming here? He says, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. And if he is able, say able. Able. Say able. Able. If he is able to fight and kill me, look at this condition. If he has ability that brings me to the point of death, then I will become your subject. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. His eye was on the army. His eye was on the army. Say that together. His eye was on the army. So he, he, he thought that his conflict, his war, his challenge was directed towards the foot soldiers, the army. He had no clue that he also challenged the God that backed and based upon his mind, I'm coming against the soldiers, the rankings, and the wars, but there was a greater war that was two-dimensional. Are you tracking with me? Is this too much reading for you? Okay, I don't care anyway. He said, I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing, hearing, look at verse 11. On hearing the Philistines, what? Thank you. Saul and all the Israelites were these two things dismayed and terrified. What the word dismayed means is to be removed from a focus point. It means to be disturbed, unsettled. How many know God brings people to focus points? You should have one. Every church should have a focus point. A lot of them don't, you know, but every church should have a focus point, a vision that makes them distinct from the thing around the corner. Every life should have a focus point so that it doesn't flirt with every career and every relationship and every option that it has. A life without a focus point is inevitably destructive because it means it gives consideration to everything around them. That's how people marry bums. That's how people uh, get in bad relationships. Where there is no focus, there can be no stewardship. When you know where you're going, you know what you need. Come on, say amen. And so in order for uh, uh, you to be unsettled and disturbed, something has to take you off of your focus point. And contextually, glory to God, this is good to me even if you don't like it, contextually, the, 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 the objective of the things that Goliath said, and once what he said was conceived in the hearing of Israel's army, then they were dismayed and terrified. I'm not preaching yet, but this is making me feel a lot better. They were terrified. There was a spirit of terrorism released, not externally. There were no bullets at this point. This was psychological warfare that was onslaughted about against them based upon what their adversary said. Now, who will be very honest and lose their shame and say there has been times where you have gone into emotional and mental and soulless terrorism, where things that you were dealing with and things that were you were afraid of and things that were coming against you and the devil he does a great job, he don't ever use sign language, he starts to articulate and shout to you why it is and how he's going to kill you and who's going to be there and why you'll never finish school and why you'll never see your future and why you'll never grow your church and why you'll never see your marriage plan, he'll start to shout these things to you and it brings upon you a dismay or unsettles you from a foundation makes you do things you wouldn't have ordinarily have done, makes you wander and drift and roam in your heart and in your mind and in your desires and then after you've been dismayed terror is the only other thing left you've got to be tormented in the night about where you should be versus where you are don't look at me like that, you've got to be tormented about how everybody around you that is already RSVP for hell is making more money than you while you believe in God on minimum wage and living right working at McDonald's and keeping your drawers up and can't complete a good degree and it looks like everybody around you that's sleeping around and hoeing and going and slowing they get money and cars and favor come on talk to me there's a spirit of terror my God you teach it thank you Lord 
Go to verse 20. I haven't started yet. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm terrified. Come on up, Papa. Hallelujah. Verse 20. This is the condition, the scenario, the setup, the challenge, the crisis, the problem. Look at verse 20. Early in the morning, David left the flock in care of a shepherd, loaded up.